Who's excited about today? Am I the only one? I am so excited about this morning and this afternoon. And of course, for me to say that, you know, food has to play a part, of course. Uh, we have our annual, well, it's, it's going to be a year from now, it'll be considered annual, but today is the first time we're going to have something called a ministry fair this afternoon. Of course, we have our fifth Sunday potluck. I want to invite each of you to join us immediately following the service. We have our potluck Sunday, but downstairs, our leaders have been spending time putting posters together, putting pamphlets together so that you can see all the things that, is, that are happening here at Tabernacle. We are encouraging you to get involved, but at the same time, we still want you to see all the things that's happening. So I want to encourage you once again to stick around and see all that God is doing. And of course, enjoy some time of fellowship, enjoy some time of food. It's going to be a great time after the service here in a moment. This morning, I apologize, it's a little warm in here. Uh, I think one of our ACs is broken. I could be wrong, so I apologize about that. And I'm going to do everything I can to um, share in an efficient manner while at the same time we're talking about a very important topic. Uh, something we just sang about a moment ago, and the question I have for all of us this morning is, who is Jesus Christ? You enjoy the day in New York City, seeing all the sights, when all of a sudden a camera crew runs up to you, runs up to your family, your friends who you're there with, wants a spontaneous interview. And he, they don't ask anything about the White House. They don't ask anything about politics. They simply ask, who do you think Jesus Christ is? So I wonder, what would you say? Maybe you would say he's a good man. Maybe as our brother just already said, you would say he is the son of God. Maybe you'd say he's a character made up by the early church. Maybe you'd say he's nothing more than a first century wise teacher, the king of kings, a prophet, a lunatic, the Savior. If you walk the streets of any city today, you'll hear all these answers and more, but that's nothing new, is it? Jesus Christ himself asked the disciples the same question. Matthew 16, who do they say I am? They gave him four answers. A prophet, a great political leader, the Son of God, and some people even thought that he was John the Baptist, risen from the dead. Over the past 10 weeks, we've been going through a series titled The Redemption Story. We've been scanning the entire Bible, looking at major themes, main topics. We spent a lot of time going through the entire Old Testament. And we've seen the purpose of the Old Testament is to point us to a Savior. Adam and Eve brought sin into our world. Now the rest of the book, the rest of the Old Testament is looking, searching for someone to save us. Last week we saw the miraculous, we saw the historical, we saw the factual virgin birth of Jesus Christ. And today, week 11, we're going to look at the ministry of Jesus. Jesus' public ministry was roughly three and a half years long. And in this three and a half years, Jesus accomplished what no other person could ever accomplish. Next Sunday, we'll mark. Uh, Michelle and my and my kids, I guess, fourth year serving as your pastor and as your shepherd. And over those four years, I've yet to figure out how our intercom system, we have an intercom system here, and every time I've hung up on people, I apologize, I've probably hung up, on, hung up on you before, I just can't figure it out. And in less time than I've tried to figure out this intercom system, Jesus Christ has literally changed the world. John 21, 25 says, Jesus did many things. The whole world itself could not contain the books that could be written. Jesus preached life-changing sermons. He told relevant stories. He healed hundreds from incurable diseases. He fed thousands miraculously, calmed storms instantly, walked on water confidently, raised people from the dead, cast out demons, and handpicked and trained 12 men, 11 of those men, would go on and change the world forever by spreading the word of Jesus Christ. This man, Jesus' prime mission for coming into the world was to go to the cross and lay down his life as a ransom for sin. Mark 10, 45 says, For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve others and to give his life as a ransom for 
many. That is why he was born. That is why he suffered. That's the purpose of the Bible, and that's the purpose of his ministry. Jesus entered our world to die for you and to die for me. While Jesus would preach to hundreds, while Jesus would preach to thousands of people, his specialty was spending time one-on-one with others. Take a second and read about how he was compassionate to Nicodemus and Nicodemus in John 3. Take a moment, watch him smile as he shares with the Samaritan woman in John chapter 4. He was rejected by his hometown. He was rejected by his own family members. He started his ministry there, going to the cities around the Sea of Galilee, cities such as Bethesda, such as Capernaum. He reached the working class. Many of them, as you know, were fishermen. While at the same time, he was their friend. While at the same time, he ate with them. While at the same time, he rejected the so-called religious leaders of that day. He taught from boats. He preached while sitting down there in the hills. He reached people where they were. He taught about a kingdom, not a kingdom of earth, but a kingdom of heaven. He taught, Jesus taught that he himself was the gatekeeper, that he is the way, he is the truth, he is the life, he is the vine. Jesus said, no man comes to the Father but by me. Jesus says, without me, you can do nothing. And if you're here today and you don't think his message is 100% truth, let me ask you a few questions. Why? Why after Jesus went home to heaven? Why after Jesus physically left this earth? Would the disciples, would these apostles continue to preach, continue to go through horrible persecution, continue to give up their lives for this message? Some of these men were literally stoned, had jagged rocks launched at them, hitting them until they died. Some of them were fed to lions. Some of them were burned alive, crucified, and they still continued to fight and share the message. Why would they do that unless they knew without a doubt that it was truth? I wonder if there's any false truths that you would give up your life for. Is there any lies that you would definitely give up your life for today? Years later, the Apostle Paul wrote this passage about his Jesus who radically changed his life. 1 Corinthians 15, 3 through 8 says this, Paul says, I passed on to you what was most important and what has been passed on to me. Christ died for our sins just as the Scripture said. He was buried and he was raised from the dead on the third day just as the Scripture said. He was seen by Peter and then by the twelve. And after that, he was seen by five, more than 500 of his followers at one time, most of whom were still alive, though some have died. Then he was seen by James and later on by all the apostles. Last of all, as though I was born at the wrong time, I... Paul is saying, I also saw him. For three and a half years, Jesus trained the disciples. He performed miracles. He silenced the religious leaders. And he publicly shared a message that will never, ever be stopped. King Herod tried. Caiaphas tried. The horrible emperor Nero tried. Many more, of course, have tried. But the message of Jesus Christ will forever reign supreme. But for those of you who doubt, for those of you who are skeptical, I'd like to give you four of many facts that help us answer history's greatest question. Who is Jesus Christ? We begin with the fact that Jesus Christ fulfilled prophecy. Jesus Christ fulfilled prophecy. The Bible, the Bible that's on your lap, the Bible that's in the pew in front of you, predicted that Jesus Christ would be born of a virgin. That he would be born in Bethlehem, born in the tribe of Judah. That he would work miracles. He would be betrayed by a friend. He would be sold by 30 pieces of silver. That he would enter Jerusalem on a donkey. That he would be wounded and bruised. That he would teach using parables. That he would begin his ministry in Galilee. That he would raise others from the dead. That his bones would not be broken. That his side would be pierced. And the list goes on and on of things that are predicted in the Bible about Jesus Christ that were spoken and written Hundreds of years before they actually happen. You know, the life of Jesus Christ actually fulfills 354 prophecies in the Old Testament. Now, some of you may say, wow, 
Wow, that's amazing. That's an amazing coincidence. But the truth is, it's not an amazing coincidence at all, is it? Because it goes way beyond that. Now, this past Tuesday, I was at a baseball game with some people, and I won't rat out any of them, but we were at a baseball game together. And we happened, the four of us went, and we happened to get two foul balls hit to us in one game. I still had the bruise where one hit. I wish I wasn't joking, but sadly I do. But isn't that amazing? To go to a baseball game and two, not one, two foul balls hit to you in the same game. You may say, wow, that's an amazing coincidence. But 354 prophecies being fulfilled by one man is way beyond those terms. Mathematically, the odds of anyone fulfilling any of these prophecies, this many prophecies, is literally staggering. The odds, let's just look at the number 48 if I can. The odds of one person fulfilling 48 prophecies, 48, not 354, 48 prophecies is 1 in 10 with 157 zeros after it. I was going to ask Alex to do it, but he would spend all day hitting the zero button, so we're not doing that for you. 157 zeros. Mathematically, this, statistically, this can only be God. And factually, this was only God. Amen. The historical accuracy, the reliability sets Jesus and the Bible apart from all others. Prophecies fulfilled prove there's something special. There's something supernatural about Jesus Christ. Secondly, this morning, his amazing claims prove that he is God In his famous book, C.S. Lewis, the book's titled Mere Christianity, he made this statement. He said, a man who is merely a man and said the sort of things Jesus Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on the level with a man who says he is a poached egg, or he would be the devil of hell. You must take your choice. Either this was and is the Son of God or else a madman or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool or you can fall at your feet and worship him and call him Lord and God, but let us not come with any patronizing nonsense about him being a great human teacher. He has not left that open to us. Jesus could have only been one of four things. A legend, a liar, a lunatic, or a lord. There's so much historical, archaeological evidence to support his existence that every reputable historian agrees that he was not a legend. If he was a liar, why? Why would he die for his claim and he could so easily avoid such a horrible death? And if he was a lunatic, how could he engage in these intellectual conversations, these intellectual debates with his opponents, handle the stress of his betrayal while at the same time still loving all those people who were completely against him leads us with one choice doesn't it jesus christ truly is lord god jesus claimed to be the son of god in john 3 jesus claimed that angels obey him matthew 13 he claimed to be the ultimate judge john 5 he claimed to have the power to forgive sin Luke 5, he claimed to be the one with, one with God, John 10. He claimed that he could raise people from the dead, John 5. He claimed to be the only way to God, John 14. He claimed to be the giver of eternal life in John 10. Who else in human history could make such claims, has ever made such claims, and continued to be followed by such a great amount of people? We cannot be neutral. This is a topic no one can be neutral You cannot ignore the truth. You must accept him for who he is, exactly as it says. Or you must reject him as a liar, lunatic, or perhaps both. There's no middle ground. Jesus cannot be a good man. From what he said, he cannot be simply a good teacher. Jesus not only made these claims, he also offered us evidence to prove it. He fulfilled prophecy, as we just said. He predicted the future. He performed miracles, raising people from the dead. Every person, every one of us, every person alive must answer the question, what will we do with Jesus? Thirdly, Jesus Christ had supernatural power. God is sovereign. God is infinite. He had the power over all things at all times in all ways. The fancy word 
For the fact that God is all-powerful is the word omnipotent. Job spoke of God's power. In Job 42, 2, when he says, I know that you can do all things and no plan of yours can be thwarted. You know, if I wanted to build a treehouse for Luke, now don't worry for those of you who want my son to stay alive, I, don't worry, I will not be doing this. But if I wanted to build him a treehouse, I'd need tons of wood. I need nails. I need hammers. All the supplies. I'd need tools, wouldn't I? I'd need materials to get the job done. But God himself, when he wants a job done, he simply speaks, doesn't he? There's power in his words. God created everything from nothing. I wonder if you've ever taken a trip way out in the country on a clear day and you look up and you see millions and millions of stars. God created every single one of them. Psalms 33, 6. It says, by the word of the Lord were the heavens made their starry host by the breath of his mouth. While here on earth, Jesus showered and showed his supernatural power through the miracles he performed. He calmed the storm. He cleansed the leper. He walked on water. He opened the eyes of the blind. He healed the sick. He raised people from the dead. And if you really think about it this morning, death is the ultimate reason Jesus came. He came to destroy it for us. Jesus had supernatural power, and he proves it over and over again. Prophecies fulfilled, amazing claims, supernatural power, and lastly, finally this morning, transformed lives prove that Jesus Christ is God. The great leader, Napoleon, once said this about Jesus. He said, I know men, and I tell you that Jesus Christ is not mere man. Between him and every other person in the world, there is no possible term of comparison. He goes on saying, Alexander, Caesar, Charlemagne, myself, we all founded great empires, but on what did the creations of our genius depend? And then he says, upon force. Jesus alone founded his empire on love. And to this very day, millions would die for him. Today, over two billion people bear, if not more, bear his name. This small group of 12, 12 disciples have taken his word to every corner of the earth. And Jesus Christ continues today, 2,000 years later, after walking those dusty roads in Galilee, after walking the narrow streets of Jerusalem, today, Jesus Christ is still changing lives. Amen. Billions of lives have been dramatically changed. And if we had time, I'm sure every one of you could stand up one at a time and share how God has changed your life, how becoming a Christian man, a Christian woman has transformed you into the person, maybe not what you wanted to be, but more importantly, what he wanted you to be. Amen. Listen to a story about a man named Josiah. Josiah was a 20-year-old professional musea, musician, sorry, who was headed for great things in life until a 10-year battle with alcoholism left him alone, lost, emotionally defeated. He once said, I, I had to drink just to get up at night or just to get up to go to work every single day. I knew that I had a problem, but I didn't know where to go. I didn't know who to turn to. He grew up in a traditional Christian home, had a loving mother, had a loving father. He was active, actively involved in his youth group as a teenager, but after a while, he saw his friends going from party to party, and he, he was, eventually was like, what am I missing? He wanted to see what it was that he was missing. So a few summers, or a few weeks after graduation, his friends started trying alcohol. They started trying pot. He loved the feeling of that first buzz. But sadly, it only left him wanting more. He went on to college, but he eventually failed out of college because of his addiction, which has gotten worse and worse and worse. Josiah, later on, a year or two later, in 2011, lost his mother to cancer. Struggling to cope, he continued relying on the bottle. He said, I was getting drunk every single day, but I still wanted people to think that I had everything under control. I still people, wanted people to know me as a normal person, not as the person I'd really become. Fortunately, his friends, his family saw what was going on. They had a life-altering, a life-changing intervention 
to turn that man's life around. Josiah later on admits, now, now looking back, I can see that God was trying to get my attention all along, but I was just being too stubborn. And then he says what I think is an amazing phrase. He said, it moves me to know that even at rock bottom, Jesus still loved me. Today, Josiah has a strong relationship with the king, and he goes around talking in churches, talking in high schools about the dangers of drinking, the dangers of peer pressure, and he's actually working on finishing his college degree. As we close this morning, a question every one of us, every person walking outside, every person on this planet has to face is the question, who is Jesus Christ? You say, I don't have to face it. Yes, you do. You just may be ignoring it but you still have to answer the question. We believe that a man once walked this world who was like no other man who ever lived. We believe he said things like no other man said. He did things no other man has done. He made claims for himself, which if they are not true, makes him history's greatest fraud. He predicted his own death. He then predicted that he would rise again. After he left this world physically, his followers were so convinced that they took that message and spread it to every corner of the planet. And for 2,000 years, countless men and women have believed that this man is the son of the living God. They've staked their lives upon it, and this man's name is Jesus Christ of Nazareth. This is what Christians believe. This is what I believe. But the question I ask you is, what do you believe? Where do you stand? Was he just a good man? Was he just a great teacher? Was he just a revolutionary leader? Or was he the Christ, the son of the living God? He never wrote a book. He never held an office. He never owned a home. He never had a family. He never went to college. He never traveled more than 200 miles from the place he was born. His friends, most of them left him. One of them denied him. Another one betrayed him. He was turned over to his enemies. Nineteen centuries have come and gone, and today he is still the centerpiece of the human race, the greatest source of guidance, the greatest source of divine inspiration, all in one being, and that is the King of Kings, Jesus Christ. As we close this morning, I challenge you, if you do not know that you know that you know that Jesus Christ is your personal, not your parents, not your kids, your personal Savior. I pray that today will be the day of salvation. Next week, we're going to continue looking at this amazing being. Amazing isn't really a strong enough word, is it? But we're going to be continuing our study through this story as we then will look at the death. And then a week from then, we will be looking at the resurrection of Jesus Christ. But once again, I ask, do you know that you know that you know that Jesus Christ is Lord of your life? And if you do, what are you doing with that message? If you had the the cure for cancer in your pocket, you'd be going to, everybody you know, I have it. I have the cure for cancer right here. But how much bigger is the cure for humanity than the cure for cancer? Let us pray. Father, we come to you this day and we gather on this beautiful Sunday you've given us. And I pray, Father, that you open our hearts. I pray, Father, you open our minds. Let us see the areas where we need to change. Let us see the areas where maybe you're already working. Maybe it's something that happened this week and we didn't understand it, but now we see, we realize why that happened, Father. I praise God. In a few moments, as we go into a time of invitation, that you will change lives. Father, I can't change anyone's life, Father. I don't have the power, but you do, Father. I pray, Father, that you work mightily. Change us. Make us the men and women you have called us to be. It's in your beautiful and holy name that we pray. Amen.